सर हम लाइव हो जाती हैं दस सेकंड पर बोले शुरू करते हैं गुड इवनिंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेलकम टू वेबिनार ऑन ईसीजी बेसिक एंड बियोंड दिस दी ट्वेंटी सेकंड लेक्चर एंड टुडे स्टॉपिक इज case studies on ecc we have got two speakers today dr khalid mohsin which is the associate professor and senior consultant in national heart foundation and dr kanis fatima who is working as associate professor of critical care medicine bardem dhaka uh, as usual we have got our key persons professor m athar ali sir professor abdul wadud choudhry sir and our teachers um, Rafiq Ahmed Sir and Professor Choudhury Hafizul Hasan. Uh, at the beginning of this session, may I request Professor M. Athar Ali Sir to say a few words words about today's session. Athar Ali Sir, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Firoz, and uh, good evening, uh, dear participants. Actually, we are uh, very much delighted to have two lectures from Dr. Khalid Mohsin and Dr. Khanis Fatima and. first of all i uh, like to welcome our uh, faculties respectable faculties dr rufi kamit sir from usa and dr choudhury hafizul hasan choudhury from the uh, usa and also we have got dr urun maske and some other uh, panelists dr uh, gobindopal also first of all i want to introduce dr khaled mohsin dr khaled mohsin is one of the talented academic interventional cardiologist in bangladesh he is well known actually his teaching career started as registrar of cardiology in nicbg and at that time we were his his student he has got very colorful bright academic career he is a gold medalist and he has got his mrcp and msc from uk he is very methodical very popular teacher and very fine cardio interventional cardiologist He is now working as interventional cardiologist. That is the associate professor of cardiology in National Heart Foundation, Dhaka. He also works in National Heart Foundation in Sylhet. So he is Dr. Khalid Mohsin. And after Khalid Mohsin, we have got another very genius, sincere, academic, and devoted cardiologist. And inter that is the uh, intensive care specialist, Dr. Kanis Fatima. we are proud of dr kanis fatima very because of his very academic uh, devotion she works as the associate professor of critical care medicine in bardem he is also a uh, executive of the society of the critical care medicine so after khalid mohsin uh, we will welcome dr kanis fatima and this two lecture that is the uh, dr khalid mohsin and kanis fatima they are they are after we have got as before dr rofi khamed sir and followed by the dr sudhir hafizul hasan so first of all dr firoz i yes. like to invite dr khalid mohsin dr khalid yes. mohsin please dr khalid mohsin sir please uh, share your screen and get thank you uh, thank you athar bhai for your very kind introduction and very elaborate introduction actually uh, so uh, and assalamu alaikum khalid bhai Uh, thank you dr jamil i think he is uh, probably here uh, so uh, the course directors uh, the uh, the faculties from home and abroad i uh, i welcome you all to the first presentation i like to share my screen uh, sorry can you see my screen please yes we can see your screen sir. okay Oh, Go for a slideshow. Okay. Uh, actually, the title of my uh, presentation is a young lady with recurrent syncope. Actually, young lady with syncope 
is not a very rare entity. On a hot summer afternoon, if we visit the non-air conditioned shopping complexes of our country, like the Gaussia market, we saw many ladies having syncope in a hot summer afternoon. But recurrent syncope is something very uh, rare in young ladies, actually. So uh, what's, uh, let's uh, explore the situation. Uh, uh, the, our patient, uh, Mrs. A, a 34 years old mother of an autistic child from Dhaka, attended the emergency room uh, with uh, two episodes of near loss of consciousness. Uh, first of all, first episode occurred in the morning after uh, wake, uh, awakening from the sleep, and the second one 30 minutes prior to arrival at the hospital. On both occasions, there were spontaneous recovery. There was no previous uh, premonitory symptoms, and uh, there was no convulsion as uh, testified by her husband, and the post-recovery problem was uh, not significant. Regarding the past history, she had uh, gestational diabetes mellitus during her only pregnancy so far. As regards her uh, family history, her father died uh, suddenly around the age of 40 years before he could avail any medical attention. Her physical examination was unremarkable. And the emergency physician of the hospital he spotted some abnormality in the ECG and persuaded her to get at the CCU. And the initial impression was uh, some acute coronary syndrome. And subsequently after admission, she was investigated uh, in a meticulous way. And the initial investigation in the form of hematological biochemical investigation with uh, cardiac enzymes, echocardiogram, and radiological examinations were all remarkable, except for the ECG. Uh, so actually, to evaluate the syncope, we uh, advised her to undergo a Holter monitoring. We started the Holter uh, uh, in the morning. And at 10 AM, that is the starting uh, one hour monitor again developed uh, some arrhythmia with near syncope and she was uh, cardioverted medically with some uh, amiodarone uh, bolus uh, and uh, one year, hour later she again was uh, having a similar episode that was also cardioverted medically so, so she was diagnosed as a case of arrhythmia induced with an uncontrolled. Anisul Lawal, please mute your phone. Um, uh, uh, so she was uh, uh, diagnosed as a case of arrhythmia induced recurrent syncope with an uncommon substrate. And she was treated medically. And she was advised to undergo ICD implantation during the same admission and she complied and she underwent that ICD implantation. And, but after one year of ICD implantation, she was lost to follow. Possibly she, was, uh, she migrated outside the country, possibly in USA and maybe Profixar may uh, have uh, encountered her in, in a later. Let's check the admission ECG first. This is the admission ECG. And I would uh, like to draw your attention to the chest lead. Uh, you can see the, particularly the V2, there is a, some ST elevation with the coving pattern and T inversion. And with this ECG, the uh, emergency physician suspected some acute coronary syndrome. And in the next ECG, it was taken from the monitor that uh, the, uh, the, there was a sinus rhythm and followed by a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So this is uh, uh, the cause possibly of the syncope. And this is the Holter monitor report, uh, which showed that significant uh, episodes of 
ventricular tachycardia is the sustained ventricular tachycardia. So uh, let us uh, recapitulate the causes of syncope. The as defined uh, uh, conventionally, it is a loss of transient loss of consciousness and postural tone due to acute cerebral hyperperfusion. The commonest cause is vasovagal or neurocardiogenic syncope. Uh, these are two types: the vasodilatory and cardioinhibitory type. And these are commonly occurring in unpleasant circumstances like hot, humid environment, prolonged standing, as well as some other precipitatory factors like uh, pain, trauma, uh, bad news, and something like that. The cardiogenic syncope uh, are broadly classified into two types. That's the uh, obstructive uh, causes and arrhythmogenic causes. Obstructive causes, uh, common ones are atrial uh, aortic stenosis, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, mitral stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary embolism, tetralogy of fallot, uh, cardiac tamponade, LA myxoma. Arrhythmogenic causes are tachy and bradyarrhythmia. The tachyarrhythmia uh, includes ventricular tachycardia. The bradyarrhythmia includes sinus node disease, high degree AV block. The less common ones are Brugada and long QT syndrome. As uh, our patient has, uh, uh, the, the fo she falls into a category of uncommon cause of syncope. We will discuss later on. There are some uh, uh, situational syncope includes uh, hypersensitive carotid sinus, cuff syncope, bituration, defecation syncope. As this uh, uh, lady has got. This the type, this uh, type of ST uh, T changes, and uh, this is falls into the category type one Brugada syndrome. There are other types as well. Uh, these are the saddleback pattern, and there is some uh, in bit intermediate types. So uh, whatever uh, it is a, uh, let's recapitulate some uh, background that in 1992, the two Spanish brothers, Pedro and Joseph, they first described the disease entity. There is right ventricular conduction delay. There is uh, dynamic or uh, persistent ST elevations in the right precordial lead. And statistically it's shown that the 12% of sudden cardiac death in young adults without structural heart disease, Brugada is the underlying cause. Males are affected as much as four times than females. The global prevalence wow. is 0.05%. Yes. It's higher in China. And in Southeast Asia, uh, the prevalence is about 0.1%. With but in some cases, the ECG changes are not uh, always obvious. And then uh, they need to be uh, provocated by some uh, uh, challenge, uh, pharmacological challenge. The risk of uh, VTVF, once there is a single episode, there is a recurrence risk of about 50% in the next five years. And the uh, vulnerable period of life is third to fifth decades, but it can occur at any time. And symptoms may be nonspecific like palpitation, dizziness to recurrent syncope, nocturnal ag agonal respiration, and aborted sudden cardiac death. Uh, ventricular fibrillation, uh, it is uh, usually occurs uh, at night or at period of uh, increased vagal tone, and it may be initiated by ventricular extrasystole originating from right ventricular outflow tract. Supraventricular arrhythmia is also found in about 15 to 30% of the cases. As I have already shown, that there are three common patterns, but the type 1 has got uh, diagnostic and prognostic predictive value. These are the drugs which are used for pharmacological challenge. Among those, Ajmalin, the sodium channel blocker, it is very uh, used uh, as a provocative agent. There are other agents as well. Flecanide and procanamide are antiarrhythmic drugs, but they are used as provocative agent. Here, there is a patient with uh, incomplete right bundle branch block and the Ajmalin infusion has been started. And as the dose go, 
becomes uh, incremental we see the there is characteristic pattern is emerging at a, at a higher dose so it is a provocative test there are some non specific uh, causes uh, with brugada like phenotype which we need to keep in mind uh, that those are acute coronary syndrome pericarditis and myocarditis pulmonary embolism some metabolic disorders and electrolyte disturbance aortic dis dissection thiamine deficiency post cardioversion electrical cardioversion left ventricular hypertrophy right bundle brain block asymmetric septal hypertrophy and arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia uh, pathophysiology the site of origin is uh, the particularly the right ventricular outflow tract there is a reduced conduction velocity the reduced gap junction expression there is fibrosis and disturbed depolarization it is a particular disease affecting the sodium channels the depolarization hypothesis it predicts that the, there is imbalance between uh, depolarizing in inward and outward channel during repolarization in the right ventricular outflow tract there is a scoring system which is known as the shanghai score of brugada diagnosis uh, there are some uh, uh, ecg changes like uh, spontaneous type 1 changes which uh, carries very high significance the fever induced change similar change or uh, the drug induced change as but it is not that much protective uh, value the there are the background history the cardiac arrest Uh, with uh, or documented vt and polymorphic uh, vt on vf uh, suspected arrhythmogenic syncope syncope and clear etiology this is a lower uh, predictive value the family history the first degree a relative having similar symptoms uh, there is a if there is more than 3.5 points it is a probably high predictive value 2 to 3 point possible and less than 2 points it is non diagnostic this is the shanghai score uh, the pattern of inheritance is mainly autosomal dominant uh, there is different type of genetic mutation has been found which is present in 20 to 30 percent of the patients uh, molecular genetic testing is presently indicated which uh, in a type 1 patient with type 1 disease is a class 2a indication uh the patients uh, are at definitely at uh, type 1 ecg with with unprovoked ecg there are high risk of uh, sudden cardiac death and they uh, benefit from implantable cardiac fertor defibrillator and uh, they are the spontaneous type 1 ecg holders have a high risk of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation there are uh, some uh, issues of uh, risk stratification uh, the the non arrhythmogenic syncope are also seen in brugada patient which has got uh, no prognostic implication uh, the asymptomatic patient also have very low incidence of malignant arrhythmia this is less than 0.5% per year vtvf induction in a previously asymptomatic brugada patient Uh, is associated with higher risk of ventricular arrhythmia in future there is some novel risk marker the fragmentation of qrs complex it is uh, quite significant this is a, we are seeing that the qrs complex is fragmented this uh, predicts higher risk of uh, arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death this is the Uh, fragmentation and after depolarization type of changes seen in the ecg uh, how we treat the patient there are uh, some medical treatment but we have to understand that the class 1c arrhythmic uh, antiarrhythmic has proarrhythmic effect and should be avoided antihistamine cocaine alcohol should be avoided as well and drug therapy it has got a uh, role in uh, electrical storm like 3 uh, or more vtvf in 24 hours and in 
In this group of patients, isoprenaline and quinidine are used as class two recommended medication. Uh, the fever can also induce uh, ECG change as well as arrhythmia and hypokalemia is a definitive risk factor. Uh, quinidine can be considered uh, in uh, asymptomatic patients as well uh, with type one ECG. This is a class two B indication. There are some other drugs. I don't think they have got a very uh, strong clinical indication like biperidil, uh, esacetin. These are, uh, they cause, uh, they have inhibits the transient outward current and uh, cause upregulation of the sodium channel. Uh, the, this has got some very beneficial effect. These are the two drugs which has got some uh, clinical uh, clinical implication or benefit like isoprenaline or orciprenaline. Uh, they can be used in conjunction with quinidine uh, and uh, they have the potential to suppress uh, VF and VT and normalize the ST elevation. And silostazole is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor. They also tend to normalize the ST segment elevation by uh, augmenting the calcium current and reduction of transient outward current and increase cyclic GMP and inhibition of adenosine uptake. These are the two medication which has got clinical implication. ICD is the uh, mainstay of treatment in uh, Brugada syndrome patient who have uh, survived a cardiac arrest or documented VT with or without syncope and it is a class one indication. And ICD is also indicated uh, in patients with the symptomatic Brugada patient with arrhythmic syncope and a spontaneous type one ECG. And it has shown to be effective in preventing sudden cardiac death. And in patients with drug induced changes uh, with a positive family history of sudden cardiac death, but they don't have a documented arrhythmia. In those patients, ICD implantation is currently not recommended. And ICD is not free from problems because inappropriate shock uh, over 10 years is about 37% and lead failure is about 29%. So we have to be very uh, choosy in uh, uh, advising uh, ICD in uh, Brugada patients. And in, in cases of uh, electrical storm or repeated uh, ICD shock, we need to, uh, the patient should be offered catheter ablation as well. Uh, this is a, a uh, summary of the management options. Uh, if the patient is uh, symptomatic with survivor of cardiac arrest or sustained VT, the ICD is a class one indication and uh, electrical storm, uh, the isoprenaline plus quinidine, uh, followed by ICD implantation. And inappropriate shock, we can prescribe uh, quinidine, silostazole, and the definitive therapy is RVOT ablation. And uh, nocturnal uh, agonal rhythm, uh, it is also a risk factor, the syncope, seizure, if they, we consider them to be arrhythmogenic origin, ICD can be given, but it's a class 2A indication. And uh, they can be uh, followed up as well with or without an implantable loop recorder. And the spontaneous and fever-induced Brugada patients, uh, they... So they are... Uh, if they are, have an inducible arrhythmia, uh, they can be prescribed ICD. And there is non-inducible arrhythmia, they should be followed up and they can be prescribed quinidine therapy as well. So these are the uh, management option. And uh, the Bugada induced by sodium channel blocker, they should be uh, followed up uh, periodically, but uh, ICD is not shown to be beneficial. Uh, so what are the take-home message? Brugada syndrome is an important differential diagnosis in uh, syncope and sudden cardiac death in young adults without structural heart disease. Brugada syndrome is diagnosed in patients 
in a spontaneous way or a, they can be provoked by some uh, drugs, uh, sodium channel blocker uh, in the right precordial leads. The symptomatic patient uh, with type 1 ECG uh, plus arrhythmic syncope, they are the very high risk of sudden cardiac there and should be uh, offered an ICD implantation. The risk markers, the fragmented QRS complex, uh, they also uh, predict future cardiac event. And there are some uh, electrophysiological uh, measures like uh, the, anat the electroanatomic mapping techniques uh, in the right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, catheter ablation can prevent recurrence of VT in highly symptomatic patients where the other treatment options have been exhausted. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, patient hearing. And uh, I think uh, we can stop sharing the- You want to show your second ECG also? Uh, no, no, this is a first uh, one ECG, uh, 12 bleed, and another one is uh, uh, the mo monitoring. No, no, no. You, you have got two cases, right? No, 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 one, one case, only one. Just case. one case. This is the only case you have. Yeah, yeah. So we can go for discussion for a short time. Uh, um, may I request uh, Rafika Mitsat to say, discuss a uh, few words about the case or regarding Brugada syndrome or the ECG presentation? To fix it, are you with us? Yeah. No, I think this is a well presented case. I mean, this this case shows everything, and the patient was very lucky that um, it was diagnosed before she died. So I think keeping a high degree of suspicion. Interesting that Brugada is more common in Bangladesh than in the United States. Uh, we see much less of it. But as Motion uh, Motion mentioned, that not all Brugada ECG findings should be aggressively treated with ICD. So um, risk stratification is important. One other factor that you will see, like I saw a patient who had no syncope, came to hospital with flu-like symptom and low-grade fever and had ECG of Brogada pattern. So now this patient also complained of some dizziness. So what did you do? We did an echo, which was normal. Um, no family history of sudden death. And then when the fever resolved, the EKG change resolved. So please remember that, that Brugada pattern ECG in genetically predisposed people can be precipitated by various factors, including low-grade fever. Uh, those patients don't need ICDs. They should be, but the careful family screening is very, very important uh, in those patients. So uh, please keep that in mind. So good case, Khaled Mohsin. Thank you. Khaled Mohsin. Hello, Khaled Mohsin. Please. Actually, no, no, your excellent uh, uh, presentation, that is excellent presentation regarding the Brugada syndrome and nice demonstration about the resting ECG followed by the documented, uh, that is a polymorphic VT. So what are the advices you offer to the patient's family member? Did you have any? Actually, she had a, only one child. She was a, a autistic child and uh, she was the only child of her parents. And she, her father died about the age of 40 years, uh, uh, suddenly, unexplained death. So we think that she, he, she might, uh, he, his father might have been um, one of the fatalities of uh, the same problem, but we couldn't document it. And uh, the, regarding the family screening, she, we didn't uh, find any very, very close relative, except her child. So uh, we uh, advised her to uh, take the, uh, her child to an electrophysiologist to, for uh, uh, screening in future. But she was, uh, as the child was uh, autistic, uh, she was attending the, uh, the, the Shishu hospital, the child, uh, development uh, program. They, they have a Shishu Vikash Kendro in uh, Dhaka Shishu Hospital. And uh, there we suggested the uh, pediatricians and the pediatric neurologist uh, to uh, refer her uh, uh, to an electrophysiologist. 
and uh, at that time i think uh, probably but uh, unfortunately the patient is lost to follow up because she migrated outside the country so i i don't have any further information regarding the well being of the patient as well as her only only daughter there there is a recommendation for genetic testing uh, what extra information does it give to us uh, actually uh, the genetic testing uh, actually uh, in the high risk patient uh, there uh, there there is 30% uh, i have already shown the statistics the genetic test it is a autosomal dominant disease with a variable penetration and uh, in 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 case of 30% cases we can see uh, we can find a, a genetic abnormality uh, so i think uh, the, there is a very significant chance of vertical transmission uh, to the next generation actually because the previous generation we could not identify so i think the, the child should be uh, offered a genetic testing there is no doubt about it khalid uh, bhai can i ask you a question yes please I have seen a one uh, doctor, uh, that doctor and his sister, both of them have typical Brugada type A pattern, but no history of syncope, no history of arrhythmia or anything. Yes. Structurally, otherwise normal heart. Yeah. And uh, uh, what should we do regarding such cases? Actually, uh, in a type A Brugada syndrome patient who are asymptomatic, uh so in this group of patient icd uh, uh, there is no documented evidence of arrhythmia uh, but they should be followed up uh, very uh, meticulously as uh, rafiq sir has said i think uh, atar bhai can you would you like to comment to wadud's question regarding asymptomatic patient with type uh, a yeah, both brother and sister have similar pattern yeah tell uh, brugada type ecg type a but uh, but uh, totally asymptomatic and there is no fa negative family is to other side no no, no. brother two, no, no. two two simply no, that is there is negative family is to the sudden death there is no history of the sudden death in the family history only the brugada type yes uh, this is the actually final recommendation actually what is uh, stated by dr khalid moshan bhai that is they are not should be treated aggressively but if the if the type is type 1 if the type is type 1 definitely they have got the high risk for the sudden cardiac death but type 2 and type 3 they should not be treated aggressively and actually there is recommendation for the ep study for the bugatta seed for risk stratification but unfortunately this is not practiced i think i i, I want to ask uh, to rufik sir but it is not practiced no hai that is a sir well, the ep and the medication these are very controversial because the arrhythmia is polymorphic i can induce polymorphic vt in anybody i want to and the e electrophysiology study induction of polymorphic vt is the non specific finding so electrophysiology study is not very good the question is prevention of sudden death i mean khalid mohsin mentioned multiple medications i cannot leave a patient just with medication um uh, and if they have because without defibrillator mortality is 100% in this group of patient medication will be useful if somebody has icd i want to reduce the number of shock likewise electrophysiology study we don't routinely use it i mean it is very controversial i think rather the family history detail family history risk of sudden death those are the very very important points to uh, determine um Uh, and a uh, careful history i like this patient had father died i am sure he had bulgada syndrome um that uh, he died suddenly but sir uh, what is wadud question that is the asymptomatic type one bulgada brother and sister but there is no symptom and the family, there is no history of the sudden cardiac death in the family uh, we don't we don't study those patients well, we we keep a note of that um and if there is no family history of sudden death uh, we cannot study uh, we we do not know i mean i think what will happen in the field of genetics lot of development is going on uh, and i if you look, go back like 10 years we had no clue about this uh, 
things. So I think the genetic studies are going to be more and more and we'll probably be able to identify much higher risk and, and correlating them with the genetic pattern. Because the, even the EKG change is single EKG change. There can be multiple genes and gene location involved uh, in this process. So right now, if no family history of sudden death, um, I'm going to just follow the patient um, carefully. Ravik said, is there any uh, role of an implantable loop recorder in uh, the asymptomatic patients? Um, again, I mean, if, if the patient has EKG finding only, no history of syncope, pre-syncope, no family after sudden death. How long am I going to monitor this patient? On the other hand, what I did that my patient gave some history of dizziness. I gave him a um, cardiac monitor for four weeks. That's about it. And I offered him a loop recorder that look, you can have it, but patient decided not to have the loop recorder put in. Um, in, the, in if, if there is history of syncope, then of course uh, that becomes a different story. And I have doubt about uh, that this can be, you know, somebody with Brugada can have vesovagal syncope also. And if I think that there is a question, of, there is a difference in the history, then I can put a loop record. Otherwise, I don't think it's of much value. Except for one patient, I, I saw one patient who had, this is not Brugada. This is a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, septum of 15 millimeter. And I put a loop recorder in because she was having palpitation. And one night he had an episode of self terminating ventricular fibrillation. But that's an unusual case. We don't routinely do those things. Um, it was just, a, she is a lucky patient that she had a loop recorder in place um, when um, she had this arrhythmia. Thank Sir, you. A patient who has multiple uh, ischemic cardiac risk factors like hypertension, LV, left ventricular hypertrophy, diabetes, and the ECT shows J. It almost looks like a Brugada, but yeah. has to be uh, Is there any study that suggests the presence of this uh, ischemic substrate also increases the chance of sudden death in this group of patients? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I'll I will catch those patients. I mean, we if patients with Brugada kind of ECG over around the age of 50, 55, hypertension and diabetes, we routinely catch them. Do cardiac catheter just to make sure that I am not missing a substrate that can contribute uh, to this problem. And uh, sir, and, uh, for ischemic heart disease, our preferred drug is uh, as always beta blocker. But in Brugada, the chances of arrhythmia is mostly at night when the vagal tone is high and the heart rate is low. And yeah. what is your face well, like that? It brings us. To, it brings us to the. Uh, Question of beta blocker. Do you mind? I have a. I'm on call, so I have a phone call. I have to answer that, and I'm. I'm going to come back in a second. Okay, sir. Sir, do you have any answer to that? Actually, uh, it, it is uh, shown that the beta blockers and amiodarone are largely ineffective in case of uh, uh, Brugada syndrome, and rather the isoprenaline, the it is a. With the sympathomimetic drug, uh, it is uh, it is a beneficial actually. Beta blocker is does the opposite actually. So uh, the isoprenaline in combination with quinidine, uh, it is it is a uh, it's a preferred option. Uh, and uh, another one is the phosphodiester inhibitor silostazol. Uh, these are the three medications which are currently being. Uh, prescribed, uh, but with some variable success. Not and post mostly they are uh, used for uh, the uh, combating or uh, the electrical storm after ICD implantation. So ICD is the mainstay of treatment, and uh, following ICD implantation, if the patient experiences some untoward uh, uh, the uh, the DC shocks or inappropriate shocks. Uh, inappropriate shocks, uh, I think, it can be about uh, maybe more than one third of the patient, like the 37 percent patient experience, experience inappropriate shock over a period of 10 years. So it is quite high. And the patients become very uh, prone to anxiety and their quality of life deteriorates if they receive inappropriate shocks. So in this group of patients, isoprenaline with quinidine uh, combination therapy is uh, is in 
is uh, quite indicated. Dr. Jamil, would you like to say something about it? Dr. No, I agree with you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I think all these drugs are in class 2B indication. For the fellows, this, you have to remember that these drugs are class 2B indication. As uh, Khaled Martin has said, the class 1 indication is ICT. I think uh, we can shift to may, the, our may second, ask a question? second lecture yes, by Dr. Kanis Fatima. Bhai, may Kanis I ask Fatima, a question? Associate Professor of Critical Care Medicine, Burden. Uh, please go for it. You can share your screen. Professor Jalal sir, uh, we'll discuss it later on, probably yeah, after yeah. Kanis Fatima. Yeah, right. Asatuzumar, you please ask. Asatuzumar had a question just after this. Uh... Yes, sir. Thank you, Firuz Bhai. My uh, respected uh, senior teachers and my dear colleagues, Assalamu Alaikum. I'm Dr. Kanis Fatima, Associate Professor from the Department of Critical Care Medicine, Bartem Hospital. Now going to uh, present. Uh, today's my presentation on, that is on case studies on ECG. I am uh, grateful uh, to Professor Ataharli sir uh, for his kind words and uh, grateful to Vadut sir and Atahar sir to encourage me to present uh, in today's session because uh, I'm not a cardiologist, I'm an intensivist. So actually I was uh, very nervous uh, to present today. And today my present, uh, I have prepared my presentation uh, slightly uh, differently. Uh, there is no theoretical discussion because uh, I think uh, all, most of the participants here are cardiologists and all of you know much more than me as cardiologists. I'm uh, mainly uh, focused on presenting the ECGs about uh, those. Uh, we have some confusion and some queries to uh, mainly I want to uh, share my experience and learn from my seniors and the cardiologists. I work in uh, Bangladesh Institute of Research and Rehabilitation in Diabetes, Endocrine and Metabolic Disorder, that is Bardem Hospital. This is my uh, department. This is uh, before the COVID period. Besides Bardem Hospital, I'm also involved with two other private hospitals. It is uh, something like GP. Uh, unfortunately, none of these three hospitals, we have a facility for intervention cardiology. That is, we cannot do primary PCI or temporary pacemaker or angiogram. So most of the time we get patient with other problems. Uh, very, very rarely we get patient with primary cardiac problems. Uh, this is uh, the picture now in COVID era and uh, the cases which I'm going to show. All these cases are collected uh, uh, like from October and month of November. That is between this COVID period. My first case, a 70 year old hypertensive male. He was a known patient of CKD stage four. Uh, his baseline creatinine was uh, between four to five and he did test it at the last November. And after that, as the pandemic started, so he did not visit any physician uh, from the March month of March. He was admitted in a local uh, private clinic with the complaints of scanty micturation and general swelling for seven days. There, uh, they did some baseline investigation, which revealed that his hemoglobin was very low, that is 4.7, and creatinine raised to 6.7. On the day of ISO admission, he had severe respiratory distress and developed altered level of consciousness. So he was referred to ICU and brought to our ICU. On admission, his pulse was 52 and blood pressure was 100 over 70 millimeter of mercury. ABG showed... Uh, combined acidosis and hyperkalemia. His potassium level was 7.1. Uh, this was his ECG on admission. Uh, may I request, uh, Firuz Bhai, that uh, as I have a uh, few cases, like six to seven cases, and uh, on the ECG, I have some queries. Uh, so can I discuss the yep. ECGs so, between the session? 
Uh, sure. With the permission yes. of the yes, panelists. Yes, that is better. I request Atara okay. Lisa to to make some comments on this issue. Atara, sir. Thank please. you. Now, actually, I want to hear from Kani. Actually, what was your diagnosis okay. in this ECG? Sir, uh, in this ECG, we uh, diagnosed it as idioventricular rhythm. The pulse was low, as I have mentioned. He was uh, he had uh, bradycardia, and uh, before getting all the lab report. we assume that this is due to hyperkalemia which he had at his previous hospital admission a uh, patient as his conscious level was down and he has uh, low blood pressure so we intubated the patient and put on mechanical ventilator and started nor adrenaline and after we get his uh, blood report his creatinine was jumped from 6 to 11 so we started hemodialysis and gradually patient's condition was improved we started winning the patient but uh, after 5 to 6 days during hemodialysis his blood pressure suddenly fall down and uh, monitor showed uh, tachycardia we did ecg and it showed atrial fibrillation we converted the dialysis mode from hemodialysis to can you, sled can you go uh, back can you go back to oh, the other sure, ecg sir. sure sir yeah, because that ecg we need to Last talk one. this one sir right yes So we diagnosed it as a uh, idioventricular rhythm. Yes. Was it right? Okay. So uh, anybody any comment about the, that diagnosis of idioventricular rhythm? No, I disagree with the diagnosis. No. Yes. Whether she did uh, consider any differential diagnosis? Sir, Kanish Patma, did you consider any differential diagnosis for this disease? Uh, no, sir. We did. Okay, uh, let me. Thought that I, this I, this is due to hyperkalemia. Okay. I'll make a so, comment uh, on the the QR yes. duration. Yes. is Therosis. about 100 millisecond yeah yes sir which is normal yes sir so we will consider idioventricular uh, when the qrs is wide uh, so this is not a wide qrs so definitely the rhythm is a supraventricular rhythm and the question is why we have this little bit of fast little bit that's the different story so it is not a ventricular rhythm So that, that diagnosis. So maybe, maybe it's junctional. Uh, yes. Sir. Uh, what was the potassium level at that time? Uh, sir, at 7. the 1. outside 1. hospital it was seven point one, and in yeah. our hospital it uh, seven point five. Yeah. So if you look, if you look at the first few. We are united in muscle on it, sir. They look fairly regular. Kalakujan, why please mute you? No, the fiber process is good. Okay, perfect, sir. Please. Yeah. So the, the first few bits look regular. Um. So I, as Jamal, Jamal was saying, junction rhythm, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, that's the possibility. Other possibility, sometimes in hyperkalemia, even if there is a P wave, we just cannot see it. Yes, sir. Um, low voltage P wave. Sir. Exactly, very low voltage P wave. I mean, it's pretty regular. It's a little faster. um so um it can be any of those i mean junctional rhythm uh, with irregularity why there is irregularity i cannot explain but definitely it's not atrial fibrillation because it's not irregularly irregular so we are i think we anybody else any comment beyond that sir <laughs> what about the rhythm is uh, the rhythm is, is it possible i am prof i am professor jalal uh, can yes, it be can it, it be sinus no dysfunction Yes, sir. Sinus node uh, definitely is a possibility, but in the setting of hyperkalemia, I will not use that term because potassium is seven, and that can really distort all our findings. Uh, sinus node dysfunction should be reserved for a situation where there is abnormality of sinus node function without any other reversible cause. Perfect, sir. May I have a comment, please? Yes, please. Uh, actually. is having a chronic kidney disease and that might lead to pericardial effusion as this is a predominantly low voltage ecg actually mm -hmm. uh, can can there be any uh, pericardial effusion as well which is masking the amplitude of the all the qrs complexes because we expect a higher uh, peaked t waves in in hyperkalemia yeah possible definitely Sir, okay, uh, so let's look at the next question also, sir. Yeah. If a patient with atrial fibrillation, if develops 
hyperkalemia? Is there any chance that the fibrillatory waves will be disappeared, like the P wave? But the initial part is very regular. Yes, sir, in case of atrial fibrillation, if the patient develops hyperkalemia, 7.5, is yes. there any chance the fibrillatory waves also disappear, like P wave? Oh, yes, absolutely right. I mean, the question is, it's a very interesting question because if somebody had hyperkalemia and develops, sorry, atrial fibrillation develops hyperkalemia, we may not be able to see the fibrillatory wave either. And, and that's the point I was looking at those first, first few complexes and I measured them. They look fairly regular uh, in the beginning part. So initially, that was my thought, thought process was, is it atrial fibrillation? So, but I think we should still keep the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation in this case uh, as a possibility. Sir, then, no sir, then, sir then for the working diagnosis, we will consider at the supraventricular rhythm, not the idioventricular rhythm. No, not really. Uh, yes, exactly. It's a supraventricular rhythm, definitely. Or junk, yes. junctional uh, rhythm. Junk, so junk we can call it junctional bradycardia? Yes, maybe. Junction should have a regular, uh, usually, usually. regular, but it is the rhythm is appears to be irregular. It is better to say the junctional One, arrhythmia, two, not junctional three, four, five, six. The first six bits are regular. Yeah, Next, sir. Next bits. Next, next bits are irregular. Right. Irregular. Junctional should be regular. In there's right bundle branch block as well, incomplete type. Yes, one possible. important thing that this patient developed atrial fibrillation in the next ECG. Right. Yeah. Should we go to, uh, yes, we go to next slide? Yes. yes. Next, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, after uh, giving dialysis, his rhythm become uh, sinus, but after uh, six to seven days, he developed hypotension, and at that time, we noticed tachycardia. And this ECG was taken at that time, which showed atrial fibrillation. This can happen because most of these patients are hypertensive. They have got diastolic dysfunction, LA enlargement, and most of the patients, some of these patients may develop atrial fibrillation in long term. Uh, we sent troponin I, which was marginally raised, not that much. ECG on the next morning, uh, we started amiodarone to control uh, this atrial fibrillation. Next morning, we did ECG and uh, that ECG. Here we can see that there is ST elevation, but only in lead uh, V2. Only in V2, atrial fibrillation persisted. Now, I think we want to hear from uh, Professor Wadud Chaudhuri. Wadud Thay. Uh, V1, V2, V4 also. Uh, the thing is, uh, in the first ECG, the first six beats were regular. The rate was 66 beats per minute. The next five beats were totally irregular. When it, the, the, the typical of uh, atrial fibrillation. One, two, three, four, five. The later ECGs, as uh, the field has said, the CKD patients are very likely, very prone to develop atrial fibrillation, particularly during dialysis when there is a you know, change of blood pressure, very high to very low, uh, something like that. Also, during uh, if there is an electrolyte changes. The, my uh, question is, in this type of patient, in CKD patient, uh, when the patient is on dialysis, which drug will be better suited to control the heart rate? Can we use digoxin, which can be which available widely, or we, do you have to use amiodarone? Rafi sir, can you give us some insight on that? But before that, Wadubai, just comment on these HTT changes. Uh, I would not comment on that because the changes are not typical only on lead 2. B2. Uh, so can I show the next ECG? Increase. Another one? Why increase? The Same patient. Raised slightly in case of CKD. So that was not diagnostic. Now, the next ECG, it shows typical changes. Now, these changes suggest this could be a case of valence type uh, changes. But yeah. 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 yeah, possible. 
is a significant prolongation of the QT interval as well. There is probably the patient has developed hypokalemia. Yes. Yeah. Probably after. Sir, huh? sir, sir Rupik, sir. Sir, this is easy, sir. Sir, this is that is the showing the HTD sensation. Whether this patient has got the pericardial effusion at this time. Whether these HTD sensors can be explained with the pericardial effusion. Yeah, I was looking at the AVR, but there was no change in there. So sometimes uh, hyperkalemia may induce pseudo infarction, but <laughs> affecting the uh, anteroceptor <laughs> leads as well, ST elevation induced by hyperkalemia. Sometimes it can be confused with acute myocardial infarction. So it may be confused uh, with hyperkalemic ECG changes. So these are the possibilities. That is hyperkalemia and the pericardial. Uh, that is the pericarditis. That is a pericardial effusion also. HTD changes. Ischemic changes is unlikely. But the aerobic is here. Well, I mean, uh, we can always go all through all these differential diagnoses. Uh, I will show you. I actually, as it's a bit coincidence. I have a similar patient with ECGs. We'll show those ECGs today. Um, I mean. And that's the beauty of medicine that there is no clear cut diagnosis. I mean, it's ST elevation is there. Hafiz may make a comment, but we have to entertain ischemia and pericarditis both. And as Jamal pointed out, that uh, early ECGs were low voltage, but we did not do any pericardial tapping uh, in between. And we don't have any echo, so we cannot make that um, further comment on that. But Rafik, sir, uh, the dialysis can improve the pericardial uh, uh, disease as well, actually, because we know that in uh, uremic pericarditis, dialysis is the, is the preferred mode of treatment. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Dr. Kanis, what was the yes, echo findings of this patient? But I, I think uh, there was know, no pericardial of, effusion. Let me make one comment. No pericardial effusion, and after yeah. starting dialysis, potassium level come, came uh, to normal. Yeah. For the our audience, and the panelists, of course, we are consultant level panelists, audience who are listening. We are not trying to confuse you. We are just presenting the reality of medicine. That means look at here, we are multiple consultants uh, from different countries sitting down and discussing cases, and we don't have a definite answer. And that's why in clinical medicine, we have differential diagnosis. That we look at an ECG, we think about it, and we consult each other. And I think I will encourage everybody that, look, you find an ECG, instead of saying, oh, yeah, I think this is ischemia, or I think this is pericarditis, send it to a friend of yours. Yeah, hey, by the way, what do you think? We do it all the time here um, and, and really get some input on that. Hafiz, you want to say something? Hafiz probably is offline. Uh, Rubai, um, first of all, these EKG changes are not uh, indicative of, like, uh, ST elevation MI. It is not. And... Uh, Pericarditis, hyperkalemia, we can do uh, the dialysis indicated if needed, and then repeat EKG. You can do a, an echo to see wall motion and be assured. So I would not jump on the ST elevation MI side. And the small troponin, not uncommon in uh, dialysis patients. About digoxin, we can give, we, we avoid digoxin in dialysis patients, but we can give loading dose of digoxin. Yeah. And, and, and and don't check the digoxin level. That is typical surgical resident move. You give digoxin ball, uh, loading dose and then check the digoxin level. It is meaningless. So so we can do uh, the loading uh, loading dose of digoxin to see the uh, see the control of the rate. But usually it takes longer for the digoxin compared to amiodarone. Can you go to the next? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, this was his subsequent ECG on the next day. Sinus window. Uh, Left it and So, what about the uh, T wave changes? And yes. QT prolongation. Consistent, consistent with hypogen. At that time, what was the level of potassium at that time? Uh, so, potassium was. Uh, Ad admission potassium level was high, but later potassium became normal. There was no hypokalemia. But at this time, is it, this is the at that time. Can the we... potassium was normal. Potassium was all too normal. Normal, okay. 
ultimately a uh, patient uh, we could extubate the patient successfully uh, and discontinue the inotropes and shift the patient to ward acha was the patient getting uh, amitriptyline while this ecg was done uh, yes sir uh, rafiq sir uh, after 24 hours uh, we changed to oral amitriptyline after giving iv amitriptyline for 24 hours uh, Uh, Rafiq sir and Atar bhai, can this QT prolongation uh, due to amitriptyline? Yeah, I mean it can be a combination of both too. But we you know one thing: I'll be very, very careful about converting somebody uh, because we did not know the duration of atrial fibrillation. So unless we do a transesophageal echocardiogram. and simultaneously anticoagulate the patient we should refrain from attempting to convert this patient because they can stroke out so that's one uh, thing that we try to avoid um, unless atrial fibrillation is hemodynamic even in hemodynamic unstable situation we will do a transesophageal echocardiogram to make sure there is no blood clot in the left atrium please please keep that in mind otherwise we will have stroke but um i think it can be a combination of the amio with with uh, electrolyte change i don't know what, what the potassium level was at that point so the one condition was normal one good input that hypocalcemia can lead to also qt prolongation as the patient was on dialysis that is a possible what was the level can you can you tell us uh, sir calcium level was normal at the beginning but we did not check it later uh, right. we checked it only once Kanish brother, did you shift the patient with the ECG or after normalization of the ECG? Uh, sir, after normalization of the ECG, because uh, during this taking this ECG, he was still on ventilator, uh, though inotrop was stopped. But after extubation, uh, even after extubation, he stayed in ICU for seven days due to uh, some lung problem, respiratory problem. Hafiz, uh, brother, can you ask a question? Uh, as you are a, a cat guy do you want to do the cat in this patient so couple of things uh, amiodarone related qt prolongation um, is actually least associated with uh, the drug this qt prolongation is not associated with the uh, polymorphic vt that we see but it can happen and the second thing is that um you see that biphasic t wave in the uh, v4 v5 um i'm coming to that in a second um but one comment about the te cardioversion in the in the us uh, in many emergency room uh, they are doing the te cardio uh, the cardioversion without te but as rovik bhai said if you know that there is long standing or paroxysmal then it is better to go with the te guided there was a study from canada that they looked into this and actually it was pretty safe but their data was 30 day stroke rate without uh, doing te uh, so that's something to think about i would not recommend that in this patient because dialysis left atrial enlargement probably non compliant l Admission, patient 
sir on uh, admission patient had respiratory distress with and his abg showed combined acidosis that is uh, hypercapnia okay. with metabolic acidosis that's oh, why okay. hypercapnia patient. because i worry about you know whether there is so, lv non compliant lv with the mr opened up so that's another important thing to think about yeah and accelerated hypertension uh, whether there was any renal artery stenosis but looks like this is a known dialysis so not to worry about Dr. Kaniz, may I ask? Yes, sir. Uh, this sure, patient sir. severely anemic. The hemoglobin was yeah. 4.7 on. 4.7. So yeah. can there be a secondary MI due to uh, the? Uh, was the anemia corrected? Uh, 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 sure, sir. Sir, uh, uh, before giving him uh, dialysis for the first time, we uh, collected two unit of RCC, and in subsequent dialysis uh, time, he got blood transfusion. And uh, his hemoglobin level was between eight to nine. I agree. This yeah. is type two MI, and the uh, and we don't need to worry about coronary artery stenosis unless we uh, ischemia workup. I say ischemia workup downline if needed. Hmm. Yes. Did you repeat the troponin I later, Dr. Kanis? Uh, yes, sir. But it was marginally raised. Very marginally, uh, which we uh, expect at a uh, patient with ESRD or CKD stage four. Yeah. So, uh, difference between the first and second troponin Y? Uh, not uh, much significant. Rising or no, same? No, not rising. Uh, almost same. So, Should sure. I uh, move to the next case? Yes. Please. Uh, the, excellent. But a series of PCC of a single patient and an excellent demonstration for us and for our participant. And, उटिन Okay. That is, it is the time of termination. There is a conversion of the A to sinus rhythm. This time, the patient develops the at any at problem. any right. mechanism. So, what the question is actually what is told by the Rupik sir? What is, I mean, Rupik sir, what is giving the importance that whether the uh, question is whether the patient has got the clot in the A layer or not. If it is the first time, it is unlikely. But if there is long-standing history of the peripheral atrial fibrillation, it is always to. Consider that there may be possibility that there may be clot in the ALA. Uh, sir, I uh, didn't show the sinus ECG here, but after uh, giving uh, starting the dialysis, patients uh, uh, the initial was junctional uh, rhythm, but after starting the dialysis, uh, his ECG turned to be the in the sinus rhythm. But I didn't show it here. So when the patient developed atrial fibrillation, we uh, Gave him amiodarone. Yeah. So just to just to add one point, in the yes, case of mitral stenosis, mitral, significant mitral valve disease, it is a non-negotiable about the role of anticoagulation and the TE because these are the highest risk group. And they, these are not. We talk about CAT valve, which is a significant mitral stenosis. These patients were actually excluded from the CAT valve calculation, and historically they are high risk. They were not even included in the SPAF trial or SPINAF trial, all the AFIP trial, because it was thought inappropriate to uh, to randomise the, the patients with significant mitral valve disease, and this, and also another group, hyperthyroidism group, also not included in the study. Okay, sir. Uh, my next case, a uh, seventy-year-old hypertensive male who was a current smoker. Was admitted in our ICU with sudden onset of severe headache for one day, followed by loss of consciousness. On admission, his pulse was 100, blood pressure was 80 by 40 millimeter of mercury, saturation was 88 percent with uh, 10 liter of supplemental oxygen via face mask, and he had very low GCS, that is four. We immediately intubated the patient, put on mechanical ventilator, and started noradrenaline for his low blood pressure. This was uh, his ECG. 
uh, we can see here that is uh, tall uh, P in lead two, three, and AVF. And uh, there is, uh, can we, uh, the negative P in the V1 or biphasic P in the V2. And there is sinus tachycardia. On his uh, biochemistry report, there is neutrophilic leukocytosis. Other than that, his renal function, liver function, serum electrolytes, all were normal. We sent his troponin I, which was found to be very high because the cutoff value was 0 0.06 and his trop I was 1.43. Hey, so, that's a question, Axel. So uh, we were confused and uh, looked again the ECG. Uh, so, sir, here is our question that his trop I was, uh, I can see it is about more than 20 times raised because the cutoff value was 0 0.06. But in the ECG, there is no change other than the sinus tachycardia. So we uh, diagnosed him as non elevated myocardial infarction. But as patient has altered level of consciousness, we did CT scan of brain and there was large uh, hemorrhage in the cerebellar area with uh, ventricular extension and obstructive hydrocephalus. So we could not do much for this patient. Uh, this is about the second case. So should I move to the next case? So what do, what? I, I think we need to make some comments here. Yeah. So uh, before going sure, to sir. Sir. Can I make some comment here? Sure, sir. Okay, so yes, the the what the diagnosis of non ST elevation in my I have difficulty to accept that because the clinic acute coronary syndrome, non ST elevation in my there is no clinical features here to go along with that. And the troponin rise has other reasons to explain, right? So therefore, non-ST elevation MI diagnosis, you can say troponin rise, injury, etiology unclear, or you can say possible type two, or we, do, we don't know. The reason is the patient present, this is the part I think we all need to be on the same page. And, and it is, I call, is non-negotiable. That means we cannot just sell it as non ST elevation MI because of the troponin. Regardless, what is what is the level of the troponin? Because patient clinical presentation is headache. There is nothing else, and the EKG is not suggestive of either. And you have another explanation soon, right? So yeah. we, we should not call it non ST elevation MI. And another important thing: when we call non ST elevation MI. Sir, uh, you have muted yourself. So we cannot hear okay, you. So, yeah. so, so when we talk about non-ST elevation MI, we actually mean type 1 MI. So we are committed. So when we talk about troponin, EKG changes, clinical syndrome, we should be very clear. And it is, ready, it is better to admit that troponin rise, etiology unclear, injury versus okay. type 2 MI. Here, there is nothing to suggest type 1 MI. So I think we'll be careful because the therapeutic implication is huge. Somebody may start heparin, et cetera, because non ST elevation MI type 1 anticoagulation, antiplatelets that we give. But here we need to be very careful. And, and it is very common to see troponin rise with an intracranial event. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a protocol that we never started antiplatelet or anticoagulant in a patient with altered level of consciousness without doing brain imaging. And uh, here I have. Excellent. Uh, thank you, sir. And I have a question here that uh, troponin I is here is about uh, 20 times higher. So uh, should we consider it as a uh, raised troponin I due to unknown etiology? Uh, and another, okay, uh, so sir, another question about uh, V4. There I mean, is an elevation in the end of the T wave, but only in V4. The thing is, uh, for yeah. 
the acute coronary syndrome diagnosis, one of the key components is chest pain, ischemic type chest pain. The clinical scenario should be there, it's not there. You can have to raise troponin in, in, in case of quietly, uh, quite high raise in case of myocarditis, in case of CPR, in case of cardiac injury due to other cause. So that's what half is by insisting. That before yeah. considering that one is SES, you have to have a clinical scenario suggesting that. And that could be either type 1 or type 2 MI. Here, nothing is suggestive of either of that. But so, uh, uh, to, to so add that's that why to, I'm uh, uh, what presenting this, because there's confusion. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kanis. Thank you, Dr. Kanis. A couple points it's important to add. Uh, if you are seeing the patient in the ICU after the diagnosis of intracranial hemorrhage, then you don't look at the EKG anymore because even if, if it is true, it doesn't matter. There is no, there is, you can't treat that. Yeah, and yes, this sir. can be a, a, a changes following the intracranial event. Now, if you see it before the intracranial hemorrhage diagnosis, then they will be dancing on your nerves. Oh, can you do something for this? In that case, I buy time. I buy time that you do echo, you find out what is the etiology of the altered mentation, get the CT exclude because safety first. Now, 20 times of troponin high. There is, it, it sounds bad that 20 times, but also if you look at the troponin plot and the differential diagnosis of troponin from the Jack paper, that troponin and the differential diagnosis of troponin, when the troponin is absolute value, like 50, 100, then you differential falls below on very few. Myocarditis, acute coronary syndrome, MI. But if it is, you know, 1.6, it is not that high actually. But we created this sensitivity 0.02, you know, different fifth generation even lower. So that's why the it sounds like 20 times high. But 1.6 is actually not that high. And many times with the adrenaline surge, we see this, you know, adrenaline surge related injury and troponin rise. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have done. Yeah, have got tall, tall uh, P wave. That means P pulmonary, right? I think, uh, Dr. Dr. Govindo, I think the question is about MI. Uh, we are not discussing about P wave. Uh, you have, you can discuss. Can I make uh, it? Firuz, I, I want to say another thing. Sure. When I was a student, uh, one of our teacher uh, who taught us that troponin I, if it is uh, raised six to seven times, then uh, think about other differential diagnosis. But if it is uh, raised more than 10 times, then it is always uh, due to so, cardiac cause or MI. I think, I think uh, but uh, there is no... I. Man, I don't know whether uh, he has any reference from book or anything. As my teachers are here, I want to learn I, from them. I think we can we can we can yes, follow the follow the things what uh, Professor Asan Hafiz yes. and Professor Wadud sir said that clinical scenario. I in, in increase is a one of the criteria, but it should be yes. supported by clinical features or ECG features or eco features, imaging features. If these three are not present, on that case, uh, 1.4 troponin A may be due to non MI causes, causes non myocardial causes. Firoz, can uh, I make a point, please? Sir, sir, just a minute. Thank you, Dr. Kanis. Uh, we are short of time, so we'll listen to your next cases in another session. We'll go for the sir. session of Dr. Rufik, sir. Firoz, sir. Achha, just let me tell Actually, uh, there are two. That is, uh, Wadud Bhai and uh, Khaled Moshan want to make comment on this ECG. But before that, Kanis Fatima. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, your cases are very, very interesting, and we are very much really. I got uh, too much interest, and they, you created a very good field of discussion. That is, an endless discussion about your ECG. Really excellent. And because of the shortage of time, your next presentation I want to shift on the. Second or ninth January? Are you ready? I think we'll. Uh, inshallah, sir. If everything is okay. No, no, and no, no, really. no, actually, no, no, no. We want to I'm, see your uh, the rest that. of the ECG. We want to see your rest of the ECG. But uh, okay. actually, we have got that two presenters, uh, Rupik sir and Hafiz sir. Okay. So,
uh, I think I I will request you to stop your screen share and uh, your next session will be on the second or ninth January. I'll let you know. What does I? Okay, thank and you, sir. Are, actually, what does that Khalid Mohsen want to make comment on the last TCC? Khalid, please. Uh, okay. Now, the, on the other side of the coin, there is another entity which we say find that there is a very significant precordial uh, STT changes without any troponin rise. We call it is a cerebral T in associated with intracranial bleed. So we have to, this is the other extreme uh, point. Is here we see no ECG change, but the troponin is raised. And in cerebral T, there is significant ECG change, but there is no troponin rise. So this is due to the autonomic disturbance caused by the intracranial bleed. So Khaled, um, I just wanted to add, that is a typical pattern that we, comes in the exam. Giant T waves and the QT prolong, that is really important to recognize. And I say this, if the EKG looks ugly and uglier, then it is less likely ischemic. So be careful about that. And then you may be confused with another entity that comes with um, the intracranial hemorrhage. You do the wall motion, and you may be fooled. It may be wall motion anterior, but look careful. It could be takasubu with the stress cardiomyopathy with intracranial hemorrhage. Bottom line is, try to find out an excuse not to cap these patients. Hafiz, uh, can troponin come from brain tissue? Troponin does not come from brain tissue. The troponin eye sensitive. This is... Okay. Uh, this, uh, the, this all injury from the myocardium. Okay. Like, uh, can it be yeah. in this case as well, the cause of raised troponin? Yeah, so the, it can be, and, and, and a small number is typical, but to prove that we need um, the, you know, ideally angiogram and typical uh, ballooning syndrome, but if you don't do angiogram, there are plenty of uh, data now that if you do echo and you particularly use definitive contrast, you can demonstrate that typical Takasubu pattern. Yeah. But my issue is that whatever it is, it's not going to change the management. Professor, please, uh, we are waiting for you. So, uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> for our audience that look, uh, we have been through this confusing cases and I'm going to have I request uh, Dr. Kanis to stay with us. I Interestingly, yes, that I, I was planning to present these cases. And, you know, some cases we have no proof. And then when we can prove definitively, then it helps us reinforce our clinical diagnosis. So this is the first ECG I'm giving to the audience to answer. Uh, give them 30, minutes, 30 seconds and then please put the poll up. There will be a series of ECG from this same patient. This is a 52-year-old male who was admitted with shortness of breath, hypertension, has borderline renal impairment. And this is the ECG. This is, please remember the date. This is August 27th. And I'm giving the heart rate is 102 beats per minute. The poop pulls down. Very actual environment. <laughs> okay. Oh, this is excellent. I think a lot of respondent. Uh, I'm going to go over sinus tachycardia left hand enlargement is a partially correct answer. It is not normally CG because uh, there is tachycardia. So that makes it abnormal, number one. Number two, there is voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. Now the question is, 
number D, is it pericarditis? I mean, Odud is the master of pericarditis, so he uh, he should comment on this. Will you, Odud, will you diagnose pericarditis from this ECG? Uh, no, First, classical changes we see in FVR. Yeah. These are absent here. There would be PR segment elevation and ST segment depression. That's not there. And okay. there is not widespread ST elevation, also absent. Yes. So, sure. Even though I started with the discussion that we're going to talk about pericarditis, that does not mean the ECG will be pericarditis. So, please remember that, uh, that this is not pericarditis because it does not have the feet. There is some, you know, in lead V2, V3, there is ST elevation that can be within the normal pattern. Um, of ECG finding, but okay, that's but I think this is a very good answer. Okay, next ECG, same patient, uh, two days later. Unfortunately, yeah, patient, patient develops yeah. chest pain, and now this is the ECG: mild chest discomfort, heart rate is eighty-one, and I have this ECG. Let me know. Same patient, please remember, same patient, 52-year-old male. Now he has developed mild chest discomfort and has shortness of breath. Are there chest pain? Are there chest pain? Yes, sir. Let's see, am I? Okay. And until later, am I? All right, sir. So, uh, Hafiz. Hafiz is offline. Um, Look at him here. It seems uh, very good, idea, sir. Okay. So, the question is uh, number, I want to discuss answer A. 50% uh, said it is sinus rhythm with acute inferior and lateral myocardial infarction. Why, why are they wrong? And 35% uh, said pedicarditis. Uh, so the, uh, it's a majority poll, right? It's like US election. Yes, sir. The, okay, so the, the confusion regarding AVR. The okay. ST depression in AVR can happen in case, case of LCX obstruction. Yes. In this patient, this patient has got lead to elevate, uh, ST elevation is lead to is more than three. Mm -hmm. There is elevation in AVL and one. Most likely it is an LCX obstruction. In LCX obstruction, the ST will be mm -hmm. down in AVR. Okay, so that's in their favor, right? Sir, yes. can what will be against diagnosis one? Sir, can I say something? Please. The most interesting thing is that when the circumflex is involved, uh, you, 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 uh, there it will be ST elevation in lead two more than lead three, which is present here. Okay. But the changes. That's one. The changes. These are not typical cope pattern. Okay. Yes. yes. Here, that's the point against and ST depression. So okay. possibilities are actually one and four. Okay. We consider either one of them. With the clinical scenario, we have to decide. Okay, fine. So I'm going to discuss normal ECG is out of question because this is not a normal ECG. We see ST elevation in place, whatever the cause is. Number two, sinus rhythm with early polarization. Please remember that this is the same patient that we are discussing in a series. The patient did not have the same ECG before, and it's a little bit more than what we expected. So we still have left with number one and number two. And the thing about this is that there is concave ST elevation. And the problem is that the patient is having chest pain. And I was mm -hmm. consulted on this patient. And so we struggled. So what we did, I'm going to give you a second report and I'm going to put the poll again. Now, we did an echocardiogram, ejection fraction was 30 to 35%. There was no regional wall motion abnormality and there was moderate pericardial efficient. 
So now let's see what the audience thinks uh, by base after we found this. I mean, why am I giving it face by face? Because that's how we do it. I mean, if somebody came to me and the problem was that this patient was fairly sick patient. And the question was to take this patient to the catheterization laboratory would have been to his white cell count was extremely elevated. Uh, and in now ejection fraction is also the question. So this is on the 29th of August. So let's see what audience, if they change their mind now based on this echo finding. Sir, yes, sir. Sir. Can it be accurate, be accurate myocarditis? Okay, good. So now it's changing a little bit. <laughs> yes. So sir, now the term should be myocarditis. Okay. So now the, the, the issue is that because there is no regional wall motion abnormality, now the audience thinks uh, that, that probably pericarditis chance is higher. Do you all agree with that thinking process? Yes, that, sir. Okay, fine. So I'm going to give same patient. The next, sorry, the next ECG is this. This is after two more days. Patient is still having chest pain. Now this is the ECG. Now we are in trouble. Yes. <laughs> Until this time, I decided just to hold tight. Now this is the point that we were a little bit stuck. And we were, until this time, I avoided cardiac catheterization. The game changer is junctional rhythm. Yes, the junction rhythm. That is the other problem part, that now we have junction rhythm. And I was also worrying, is it two to one heart block or not? But there is no P wave at all. Sir, again, again, this goes in favor of the myocarditis, sir. Okay, let's let's see what the audience thinks. I mean, we, we should not talk first. Oh, now, let's see. Okay. So, I mean, first of all, let's. I'm going to look at number one, sinus bradycardia. There is no P wave, so I cannot call it sinus bradycardia. Uh, second. Uh, early repolarization pattern is not an option probably for this patient because this is the evolving change. So now we are all stuck with these answers. I'm going to put one more poll on the same patient. Let's see if it changes. Now I have the troponin. On the 27th, it was 1.1. Our level is 0 0.03. And then on that day, it was 4.1. White cell count was 47.2. And the echo again showed moderate pericardial effusion, no wall motion abnormality. Now see what that if the diagnosis changes. Hold, Very interesting. Well, it is interesting because you know our problem was that this patient has pericardial effusion and question of, um, so, so, even, so that's interesting. Even with the elevated troponin, majority thought it is pericarditis. And Okay, so what, at this point, I had no choice but to say, look, we have to do a cardiac catheterization on this patient. And we did that. And what it showed was basically 25% RCS strength, which is nothing, and all other coronaries are normal. And we no. thought that this was really a case of pericarditis. And I'm going to show two ECGs here. Look at this clue. This is the top ECGs from this patient. ST elevation, ST depression in AVR and V2, but not no, V1 and not in V2. In the bottom is a patient with acute inferior MI. There is reciprocal ST depression in lead V1, V2, but not in AVR. I think 
So if we look at um, what it has been telling us a long, long time that ST elevation, PI depression, and ST depression in one area is a pretty good finding, actually. And then wall motion abnormality was helpful. But of course, as in this case, I mean, I, that brings us to our cases of that Dr. Kanis described that, look, in this case, we held off cardiac catheterization for four days. And then at the end, we say, look, we have to look at it. And then we, our final diagnosis was a pericarditis with possibly myopericarditis that is causing elevation of ST segment, um, troponin. Can you any comment on this? Professor, may I have a question? Sure. Actually, doing a catheterization in a patient with pericarditis is also very hazardous. Because if you, the, the small amount of heparin we use during cardiac catheterization can lead to cardiac tamponade with aggravation of the pericardial effusion. So if you want to do the cardiac catheterization, we have to do it heparin-free. That is very important. Yes, yeah, Khaled Motion is absolutely right. And that's why we held off. But the last ECG, with that junctional rhythm, with that ST elevation and troponin, we had to, and it was done, as you said, it was done without any heparin. So if, if we are planning to do a catheterization in this kind of patient, you have to be somebody who is very quick, fast, and can go in and out quickly without doing too many pictures. And that's what it was. Um, what, would, what would CT coordinate angio? CT angiogram? C yeah. What would, you, what would be the best option in this patient? Well, I mean, that would be, have been an option. The problem is that <clears throat> this patient, at that point, heart rate was 43. And it, it was much quicker for us and to get a definitive uh, a diagnosis. And a couple of days earlier, maybe when the rate was slower, um, uh, faster, and no junction, the, probably at that point, pericardite, I don't, uh, CT angio would have been a good option, but I don't know how presence of pericardite will affect that. I mean, that's an option, of course. <laughs> Are we done or do you have time? But the no, professor, if we do the uh, CT angio, and if the patient actually have coronary disease, to the uh, coronary procedure again. Absolutely, absolutely. That was the problem that- yes. <laughs> To the CT injury, you have to do the uh, uh, proper injury. Yeah. Sir, WBC count was very high. Yes, patient was septic also. Yes, sir. So all, 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 all could be uh, uh, encountered by- <laughs> A background. Can, who is in the background? Okay. Please do. Sir, please say. Sir, as, as because there is WC count is very high. Yeah. Uh, pro, uh, what about uh, what about the subprocalcitonin sir? If it is septicemia, all yeah. these things can be uh, correlate with the septicemia, sir. Oh yes, definitely. I mean, no question. I mean, the, there is there is sepsis. Uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, and that could have uh, contributed to this uh, to this problem. That's why it was a very sick patient and. Um, and we were we struggled with this patient, and at the end we were forced to do the catheterization, especially the last ECG forced us to do the catheterization. What is? So one question is that there is no regional or global wall motion abnormalities, but there is ejection fraction is too low. Yeah. How can you yeah. explain? Sir? Oh yes, I mean patient probably has non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. If you have non-ischemic cardiomyopathy you will not have uh, regional wall motion abnormality. Um, uh, so I think- The global wall motion abnormality. Uh, global abnormality, wall motion, yes. But that was helpful to rule out uh, is, uh, coronary ischemia, acute ischemia. Because with acute ischemia, we would have seen a regional wall motion abnormality, which we did not in this case. It was very good, sir. Yeah. And then how can you explain, sir, uh, junctional bleeding in a case of only with very uh, myocarditis, sir. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the As myocarditis option, can lead to junctional bleeding. We don't know. I have never seen this, but if you think about pericarditis, that can precipitate atrial fibrillation. The question was that if myo myopericarditis have affected the sinus node in certain way, and that caused this thing. Um, because we know we can get atrial fibrillation in case of patients with pericarditis. Sir, uh, sir, assalamu alaikum. Yes, sir. 
sir with that uh, high wbc count is doing cardiac cath uh, uh, pose any threat to the patient or increase any susceptibility to uh, uh, cardiac performance and after listening is they have been giving antibiotic for at least 3 or 4 days yeah it's been proven antibiotic already okay. i mean of course of course this that was the main reason that despite elevated troponin and um as television with chest pain we did not do cath for 4 3 4 days at the end this junctional rhythm um uh, possible heart block forced us to do it um but that was helpful in in ruling out the case i mean it, we you cannot take this decision very lightly um in in cathing this patient because it's a sick patient so i'm going to uh, do one more ecg um uh, i'm going to skip this one uh this is a patient that is scheduled for mitral valve replacement um and this is the ecg before the surgery <laughs> this there is uh, very nice that was good very nice It, very nice alien are via hypertrophy in mitral stenosis and is easily common okay so this is this is very good i like this uh, answers uh I mean, it's true that one person said sinus bradycardia, otherwise normal. And my answer to that person is, I mean, it, it's, it is sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia, which is true. But the QRS is wide. Once the QRS is wide, um, that is not normal ECG. So please remember that. Um, number two, sinus bradycardia with the right bundle branch block is a good answer. But the question is, is there another beautiful girl standing next to this girl? Uh, uh look at that also and that beautiful girl is left anterior fascicular block yes <laughs> and there is one more thing left at end line so i think they, they, this is very good i think i think our session is helping and i'm glad that all of oh, you are yeah, participating yeah. in answering yeah. this question yeah. now so I mean, this is a bit of good i mean i mean sorry to do this can you mute yourself please yeah. can you mute yeah okay and so the patient goes for mitral valve replacement and on the day of mitral valve replacement this is the ec november 2nd is just recently uh, post mitral valve replacement this is the ecg ah and this is a very important part in and because once the patient gets surgery the surgeons will call us to look at it whether the patient needs pacemaker or not do we need to do anything do we need to put it in? and good thing about post surgery is that there is already a temporary pacemaker in place they put epicardial wires and which they leave it for 3 4 days so that's helpful okay what type of operation was there is was it uh valvular dilatation or replacement no mitral valve replacement so majority said complete heart block yes sinus bradycardia nobody said number a which is very good uh mobis type 2 av block and only one person said wenkeba av block so let's look at it so what's happening that the rr interval is irregular <clears throat> if it were a complete heart block i would have expected that the escape beat will be regular which it is not 
So even though the report says complete heart block, I did not think this was complete heart block. Mobis type to second degree uh, is a possibility, but look at the PR interval. There is some change, this one. So I then measured the other intervals. The PP interval is, these are the P waves are good. This is, and this is what I thought is that this P wave blocked, this P wave conducted, this P wave blocked, this conducted, this conducted here, this blocked. So over here, it is behaving like Wenkeba. Over here is two to one, whether I call it Mobis one or Mobis two, I cannot say that, but this is two to one AV block. So it is a little bit of complex mixture of, but definitely I don't think it is complete heart block. I think there is conduction. And the clue to conduction is presence of some irregular beat that it brought forward. And I thought this conducted to this one and this one. So this was on the second, and this is the next day uh, on the third, same patient. Thanks, Navidu. First degree block. Ripu, B second dia tapra dos second de juno pose dio, tell it shoba dek the shubi the hobby. Okay, sir. First degree to look. Thanks. Good. So that's, that's pretty uh, good distribution. So, I mean, the question is what this is not. Even though I put atrial fibrillation, I don't think this is atrial fib because the RR interval is very regular except here, and that is produced by the PVC. So this is not atrial fibrillation. If I look at in the beginning part of the tracing, I cannot see any P wave, then I can consider this as a junctional rhythm with right bundle bind block to PVC. However, the clue was that after the PVC, I can see the first degree AV block. And then if I follow it, I can see the P wave is here on the T wave and it's sinus rhythm with first degree AV block. And that is the diagnosis. So this was on the third. I, I don't want to make your life difficult, but next day on the fourth, in the middle of the night, this is the ECG, same patient. And it is important, this is not only academic discussion because I, we have to make a decision whether, what do I do with this patient? And this is the ECG next day. Very difficult. While you were answering this question, I will request everybody that when you see interesting ECGs, you collect them, scan them, and write down the brief history. And collect that collection becomes helpful um, if you have some clinical history with the ECGs. Okay. Uh, for the first was, one person said sinus rhythm with first degree AV block. If you look at some of the P wave here, if you can see my point, it looks like first degree, but the next one changes, next one changes. So the question is junction rhythm, nobody said junction rhythm, which is fantastic, complete hard block versus Wenke by AV block. So let's look at the next ECG. So if you look at here, you can see the RR interval is perfectly regular. And then I have these P waves, which have no relation to the QRS complex. You can yes. see a P wave here. This is just the P wave beginning of the QRS complex. So now that tells us uh, it's complete hard block. So please be carefully look at this, look at 
the P waves, if you can find them, um, and you can find this, you can see the P waves here. And one P I imagined here, but this P wave is not an imagination because if you look at the T wave morphology here and versus over here is different. So that's the P wave. And also just before the QRS complex, there is a P wave because in other places that's not present. So that's the P wave. And that is supported by other lead here. So this is complete hard block. Now, so next okay. same day around in the morning, this is the ECG of the same patient. I'm going to finish. This will be the last ECG for the patient. And because after this, we decided not to follow the patient anymore. Group beating. Madhur already gave the clue, and I hope it is 100% uh, correct answer. But the answer, whatever you think uh, is, is, the, uh, is right. Oh. Good. Can it be a BD cessation with uh, junctional rhythm? Yeah, it, it, yes, sir, it's a possibility. Okay. So nobody said sinus rhythm with sinus arrhythmia, which is great. One person said atrial fibrillation, and the answer to that, with atrial fibrillation, first of all, it will be totally irregular. It's not irregular. You can see a group pattern. One group here, one group over here, one group there. Secondly, you can see P wave. So in favor of atrial fibrillation is irregularity. Against is the presence of P wave. So that takes it out. Second question is, is it complete heart block? If it was complete hard block, again, the escape beat will be regular, which it is not. There is a grouping in this that takes um, that probably complete hard block. So let's look at the timing. So I'm looking at, this is the P wave. This P wave conducted, this prolonged PR, the RR gets longer, longer PR, and then blocked. And again, short PR, long, long, and block. So this is a group beating. Group beating can happen in two places. One is common is sinus arrhythmia, other will be Wenke Ba if you block. Look at, let's look at the numbers of Wenke Ba. If you look at the RR interval in Wenke Ba, RR interval would get shorter. First one is long, second one is 680. Here, 820 and 680. What's happening with the PR interval? 220, 480, 500. Why do you, why is the first RR longer? Because the first PR is the longest prolongation in typical wine keba. It's 480. From 220, it increased by 260 milliseconds. Next one is increased only by 20 milliseconds. That's why the next RR interval. So if you look at typical wine keba, the first RR interval will be longest, and then it will gradually get shorter. So this is typical one keba phenomena. And this patient uh, uh, conduction came back perfectly normal. We stopped following the patient. He went home. Thank, thank you very much. And unless anybody else had any comment. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Jamil, want to say something? No, sir. Excellent. Excellent, sir. I think, sir, we, after the lecture, yeah, I'm, I'm a learner. Questions are very good because it deals with real life scenario. Exactly. Sir. And follow up ECG of the same patient, Govindu. Sir. Uh, sir. We have got two more presentations, but it's 11. No, no, no uh, Firoz. Uh, Actually, uh, half is why we will present it the next Saturday. Okay, good. All right. All so, sir. More than 11, 11, 5. It is better to come. Stop. Sir, one ECG of Govindu, sir. 
Anis, was it helpful that that ECG? Yes, sir. But you know, we we it, it's funny but, that uh, I it's held a very off complicated doing, one. <laughs> well, I held off held off doing catheterization for four days, but then at then we were forced to do it. I mean, we had to have a definitive answer for this case. But can is Fatima actually presentation like you, sir? But that, that is several issues of the same patient. Follow up ECG. Yes, that is, that is good. Thank sir, you, sir. One, one more presentation. Only one ECG from Dr. Govindo, sir. Okay. Govindo. I, I like to show or uh, Evo or Piroz Bhai. No, no, you can, you can share your screen. Uh, I can also share, sir. That's okay. But the ECG. I think yes, it's ready on my part. I can show it faster. Go on. Okay. Dr. Govindo, you can, you can read it. A 64 years old uh, female, diabetic, female, having palpitation and pre syncop. And what are the ECG findings and what is the diagnosis or possibilities? And this is not the first ECG. On admission, ECG was uh, PSVT, uh, supraventricular, for example, supraventricular tachycardia. And then uh, second ECG, sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia, and this is the third ECG. So what are the uh, interpretation? Govindo. Comments, yes, sir. Achha, is this ECG after the adenosine? No, sir. SBT is spontaneously reverted. This particular ECG to me, it seems that the first two bits are normal sinus, followed by an, uh, probably it's a supraventricular ectopic bit. Again, compensatory pause followed by a normal bit. And then a uh, little bit irregular tachycardia for brief time in the lower panel um, rhythm strip. So it's uh, here it uh, developed atrial fibrillation. Uh, Jamil Bhai, my question is, look at the fourth ECG bit. The PR yeah. in is not like that of the first two bits. First two bits, sinus bit. Sinus yeah. bit. Sure. But the fourth yeah. bit yeah. interval is very... Uh, is, uh, short, the, short. It became short. That may be the, the, after uh, uh, compensatory pause, the conduction improved. Is there any chance of uh, uh, sinus rhythm with atrial tachycardia followed by uh, atrial fibrillation? But in this uh, ECG, there is no tachycardia before that atrial fibrillation. So it's difficult to uh, say atrial tachycardia. And in that uh, atrial tach uh, tachycardia, the P wave should be uh, a bit uh, different from the normal sinus P wave. If you... so there is no definite such type of P, uh, abnormal P wave. Please, Wadud, sir, is there any comment? Bro, fix your comment, please. Well, I think Jamil pointed out very rightly. If you look at first bit sinus, second bit sinus bradyard, and then there is a supraventricular premature bit, and then there is a P wave. Even though the PR looks short, it's within range, 120 mm. I think it is conducted. And then there is the actual premature bit, and there is a second one just after the QRS complex. So it's first couple of bits, it goes into atypical lateral flutter, and then it degenerates into actual fibrillation. So I think this is what's happening is, and uh, supported by the fact that this um, uh, the irregular RR interval. Um, when I see all this wavy wavelength, I always think of artifact, but it is not artifact because the ECG before was pretty good. It's not a good quality ECG. So I think it, as Jamil said, that actual premature beat followed by actual flutter degenerating into fibrillation. 
sir okay, sir. Mm -hmm. sir whether the rhythm strip sir the rhythm strip on the yes, bottle yes. Mm -hmm. as as on the right side of the panel the left side of the panel the rhythm strip that the qrs complex actually correlate with the qrs complex of the limb leads but on the right side not so oh, no these are not simultaneous this continuous is not, it is not simultaneous um, the first couple of beats the first few beats are same as the 12 bleed rest of the rhythm strip is independent of the um, 12 bleed ecg yes sir yes sir oh, so govindo okay next govindo what is your final diagnosis govindo uh uh, final diagnosis, uh, 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 I have uh, uh, already yes. underlying sinus rhythm with three sinus uh, POF, red, uh, already I put a, another ECG uh, with drawing the arrow, but I cannot show here. And yellow arrow show what looks to be additional lateral activity. Some are blocked TSC. They are hard to tell if this is atrial flutter versus a first atrial tachycardia for uh, uh, subsequent six beats, after which atrial activity becomes much more variable without defined uh, waves, it, as it looks like the rhythm deteriorated to atrial fibrillation. Sometimes this happens, successive rapid atrial activity until an, until an atrial wave in the atrial refractory period, which initiates atrial fibrillation. Thank you, sir. However, Govindo, actually, message to our participant is that the explanation given by Rupik sir is the message to our participant. That is the that is the that is the first that is the atrial flutter degeneration to the atrial fibrillation. Your your explanation is excellent, but message to our participant is that the answer given by Rupik sir is the message to our participant. Yeah. But Govindo, what, your interpretation is excellent. I mean, you yes, did sir. exactly what we said. I mean, yes, I just sir. put it in the word that you already. Um, interpreted. So this exactly, is sir. Actually, Mane, actually, Mane, it was his presentation earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kavindo. It was a nice one. Okay. Uh, I think we can wrap up now. I must thank uh, Dr. Khaled Moshin, sir, Dr. Fat Kanis Fatima, and Dr. Govindapal. Pal. May I request uh, Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury, sir, to wrap up the session. Actually, it's our really a, a pleasure that our all of our teachers, all of the present, all the, those are present here. Jalasar is is teacher to all of us, and he is here. He's uh, always giving us encouragement and everything. That gives us a real pleasure. And today we have very good. Thank you very much. Because the practical in practical, life, we face dilemmas. We have to make decisions. We have to change those decisions. Uh, according to the situation. And that flexibility and willingness to uh, reinterpret and interpret again and again uh, as part of the new information available, that's the most important thing. What I tell my students is that our ego should never come before the well-being of the patients. So interpreting the ECG, sometimes we have to agree that I have been wrong this is the pro most likely the proper diagnosis or proper interpretation. And we have to entertain the thought that there is always multiple possibilities according to the clinical scenario. And Rafik Sar has beautifully shown those scenarios. And Kanis has presented in the clinical practical life what problems we face. Thank you, everybody. And the panelists and everyone, thank you. And good I night. want to say something. Yes, sir. I want to say something. Sir. Um, Jalal, sir. I mean, this is for all of us to learn something. I mean, remember his presence here. It is possible that some of us know something more than he does. But it is because of him that we have reached here. Yes. The fact that he has been sitting here for two hours with us is a blessing for us. <laughs> we should remember this. We should try to be like him. Uh, continuously learning, being present with us, even though it is possible that some of our um, panelist audience knows more than some of the things, uh, more he, than him, but he's still <laughs> above all of us.
थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फिरोज थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सर फिरोज सर एक्चुअली नेक्स्ट सैटरडे uh uh dear participant next saturday uh, rupik sir is always with us and we are very much delighted to have some lectures from rupik sir and choudhury hafizul hasan will give uh, show some essays on the next saturday and finally rupik sir dr yeah. monarul islam and habiba ferdousi will present yes. their cases in the next saturday yes i think we should start with those That's and it. then we'll do hafiz and then i will do last okay sir thank you see so like we again asking you to present and meanwhile whenever you get interesting thing a uh, mali case scenario please please up those and share with us and we can discuss together we can learn together and khaled bhai it was a masterful presentation i should say it was i i i, I was over over in front of the electrophysiologist professor atahar ali and professor rafiq ahmed it was an order city to present brugata yeah. <laughs> in front of them but you okay. present alagra is 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 she that also, lady uh, where we saw in the square hospital yes 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 jamil yeah, okay. <laughs> i took your opinion as well yes sir yes management i yeah. remember her. Yeah, yeah i remember her yes. you helped me a lot in managing this patient thank you thank you thank you sir thank you Uh, good night, everyone. Bye bye. Good night. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Assalamualaikum, sir. Yes. Good start. Thank you. Very simple. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum. Good night.